turn to Joshua chapter 6. And the title of this message is Round and Round. Round and Round. I didn't know if it was Round and Round or Around and Around. We'll see. I don't know. Maybe the teachers can tell me a little later on. But Round and Round. I'm going with that one. Uh, Joshua chapter 6. And we're going to read verse 1 to 5. It's probably a familiar story to most of us in the room this evening. And it says this. Now the gates of Jericho were tightly shut because the people were afraid of the Israelites. No one was allowed to go out or in. But the Lord said to Joshua, I have given you Jericho, its king, and all its strong warriors. You and your fighting men should march around the town once a day for six days. Seven priests will walk ahead of the ark, each carrying a ram's horn. On the seventh day, you were to march around the town seven times with the priests blowing the horns. When you hear the priests give one long blast on the ram's horns, have all the people shout as loud as they can. Then the walls of the town will collapse and the people will go straight into the town. You know, a few weeks ago during our, our week of prayer and fasting, I shared on Joshua chapter 3, there was a, a passage that God had laid on my heart for us just to lead us through that time. And as I've been continuing in my Old Testament readings going through Joshua, it probably is one of my favorite books of the Bible, so I preach from it a lot. But, but you know, the, God laid this word on my heart, and there was just something that stood out to me again as I came to it this afternoon. Just a, a little reminder for us, the people of God, they'd been delivered from slavery, in Egypt, God rescued his people from the Pharaoh and the Egyptians. God led them to the Red Sea, but he also brought them through that as well. He parted the Red Sea. There's nothing our God can't bring us through. How many are thankful for that tonight? There's no situation, as we've even heard with testimonies, no situation that God can't bring us through. And God brought his people through the Red Sea. And now he was going to lead his people after all these years, 400 years of captivity in Egypt, he was going to lead them to this promised land that he'd promised Abraham and Isaac and Jacob many generations before, hundreds of years before. And the person who was leading them was a man called Moses. Moses was going to lead them into the promised land. But as they head into the wilderness, the people of God, they don't listen to God. Fear strikes in and they end up missing out on entering into the promised land. And this journey, which should have taken them a few days from the Red Sea where they were to head into the promised land, it ended up taking 40 years. And a whole generation passes away and miss out, including Moses as well. But then we see that God raises up a new leader. It was the assistant of Moses, and his name was Joshua. And Joshua was called to lead over a million people into the promised land. This land, God said, was going to be incredible. It was a land flowing with milk and honey. But there was also going to be enemies that the people of God would have to overcome and possess the land. That's a reminder for us that although God might have given us a promise, we need to possess that promise. There's things that we need to do in order to receive that promise within our lives. And we see that Joshua was called by God to lead his people into the promised land. So in Joshua 3, as we've seen, they were on the riverbank and God performs a miracle there and leads them into the promised land. And they get there but the first city that's in their way as they head into Cana, there's a city that's standing in front of them. And it wasn't a small city. It was quite a big city. Not in surface, uh, in height. It was, a, it was a large, large city. And it was the city of Jericho. I've got a photo of it here, I believe. Thanks, Paul. That's the remains of it. That's not the city now. Uh, it's pretty disappointing if you think that was the city. But that's the remains of it to this present day. These are the walls of Jericho. The city itself was only about eight or nine acres uh, big. That's all it was. But the walls were massive. The walls were so big, the people had houses built into the walls. And you remember that even with the story of Rahab, who and her family, they lived in the walls of Jericho. There, They had a home there. And so the people of God, they come to this first city and God tells them that they are to take this city. They are to conquer the city, the first city in the promised land. Now, the people of God, they were ready. They were ready to fight Joshua. He was a military man. And this, the Israelites, they were the army of God. And they were ready to fight, ready to take this city. But you know what's interesting? Is that God's ways aren't our ways. And God had a different plan for his people when they came to the city. We see that God isn't interested in testing their battle finesse. Instead, God wants to test their courage. And God wants to test their obedience. Even though the instructions he's going to give them 
doesn't make sense in the natural. It says there in verse 3 of Joshua 6, he says, You and your fighting men should march around the town once a day for six days. God tells his people not to batter the walls down, but to walk around the city. Go for a walk once a day for six days. Just walk around the city. Take the ark, which carried the presence of God. Take the priests, you and your fighting men. Go around the city on this march to victory crusade. It wasn't a fight. It was a march. Not a battle, not hand-to-hand combat, but a simple march. That's what God told them to do. And you know, we shouldn't be surprised in our lives when we are facing things within our lives that God tells us sometimes to use tactics that are different to what we would usually do in the natural. You know, we might feel like we've got a problem in our lives and we should handle it in this way. You know, this is the natural way we should do it. We should use these tactics. You know, we should do this. But as I said, as I, and as it says in Isaiah 55, verse 8 to 9, God says, My thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, and my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. But just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Joshua could have used his military, uh, his great military mind to conquer the land. But you know, I believe one of the reasons why God didn't allow them to use their might and their own strength is because they probably would have taken their own credit for it. They would have taken the glory for it. And how many of us know here that our God doesn't like to share his glory with anybody else? He is worthy of it all. He's a jealous God and he deserves all glory and all praise within our lives. But we see for six days, God tells them, don't break the walls down. Instead, walk around the walls. And then it says there in verse 10 to 14, do not shout. Don't even talk, Joshua commanded. Not a single word from any of you until I tell you, then shout. So the ark of the Lord was carried around the town once that day, and everyone returned to spend the night in the camp. Joshua got up early the next morning, and the priests again carried the ark of the Lord. The seven priests with the ram's horns marched in front of the ark of the Lord, blowing their horns. Again, the armed men marched both in front of the priests with the horns and behind the ark of the Lord. All this time, the priests were blowing their horns. On the second day, they again marched around the town once and returned to the camp. They followed this pattern for six days. Six days straight, once a day, walking around that camp. There was truly a better way for them, but this is what God told them to do. And I'm sure they would have had plenty of things to say. But that's why God tells them to be quiet because he doesn't want doubt to creep in to even their speech as well. But God tells them to just simply obey and follow his instructions. And then we read that the seventh day finally comes. Now, by this point, I'm sure they're tired. I'm sure they were wondering, is, has Joshua got this right? Has he heard from God? Would God come through on his promise? Will really the walls come down just from us walking around? Will this really happen? Were these six days really worth it? Well, we read in verse jo- Joshua chapter 6, verse 15 to 21. It says, on the seventh day, the Israelites got up at dawn and marched around the town as they had done before. But this time they went around the town seven times. The seventh time around, as the priests sounded the long blast on their horns, Joshua commanded the people, shout, for the Lord has given you the town. Jericho and everything in it must be completely destroyed as an offering to the Lord. Only Rahab the prostitute and the others in her house will be spared, for she protected our spies. Don't take any things that are set apart for destruction, or you yourselves will be completely destroyed, and you will bring trouble on the camp of Israel. Everything made from silver, gold, bronze, or iron is sacred to the Lord and must be brought into his treasury. When the people heard the sound of the ram's horns, they shouted as loud as they could. Suddenly, the walls of Jericho collapsed and the Israelites charged straight into the town and captured it. They completely destroyed everything in it with their swords, men and women, young and old, cattle, sheep, goats and donkeys. We see here the people obeyed the instructions of God. And once again, God came through for his people. They lifted up a shout. And as they lifted up a shout, the walls came down. The city was completely destroyed. We can see even from this story, obedience brings the blessing. Obedience to God brings the blessing. Now, as we come to an end of this message this evening, you might be wondering, why am I sharing this? Why am I sharing this passage of scripture, especially for for us in the last 
prayer meeting of 2023. Surely we should be talking about Thanksgiving or something like that. Why am I bringing this to us this evening? Well, God has given us as a church many, many promises. I'm sure you know these promises off by heart. The latter days will be greater than the former days. So house full household salvation. Backsliders returning. Even recently, a church of a thousand people. These are promises that God has given us. Maybe God as well has given you individual personal promises. I know he's given me promises and I'm sure he's given you promises as well. But I know that many of these promises are yet to be fulfilled. Many of these promises, maybe some of them are starting to come to pass, but not all of them have fully come to pass yet. And I know as a church, we've been praying for years and years about these promises, haven't we? As long as we've had this prayer meeting, I can remember when Pastor Rob started the powerhouse, we've been praying for these promises year after year. And you know, sometimes that feels just like I'm sure the Israelites felt as they were going around that city, round and round, day after day, once a day for six days, and on the seventh day, going around and round again. They kept going round and round. And maybe it feels like that for us as a church. God, you've given us these promises. We've been praying these promises, but it just seems like nothing's happening. It feels like we're going round and round again. We're praying, we're calling upon God, but there's no promise yet. The fulfillment hasn't happened yet. Maybe we feel like it doesn't make sense. Why are we still praying for this promise, Luke? It might seem monotonous. Monotonous. Maybe you feel like that. Maybe we've doubted on many times. God, will his promise really come to pass? I know it can be tiring. I know it can be hard. I know sometimes it can even be foreign. Uh, be boring as well. I know it can be difficult. I know it can be challenging. And to keep turning up week in, week out and not seeing the fruit of that promise, it can become disheartening and discouraging on times. But I also know something else as well this evening. And that is God's word and God's promises never, ever fail. They never, ever fail. Isaiah 55 verse 10 and 11 says this, the rain and snow come down from the heavens and stay on the ground to water the earth. They cause the grain to grow, producing seed for the farmer and bread for the hungry. It is the same with my word. I send it out and it always produces fruit. It will accomplish all I want it to and it will prosper everywhere I send it. Here's a New Testament promise for you as well. 2 Corinthians 1 verse 20. For all of God's promises have been fulfilled in Christ with a resounding yes. And through Christ, our amen, which means yes, ascends to God for his glory. And you know, I want to encourage us tonight. I believe this is a word from the Lord for us this evening, that the Lord is going to come through for us on his promises. God is going to come through for us on his promises. The best days are ahead of us. God hasn't fulfilled these promises fully yet. That means they're still to come. They're still ahead of us. But I believe God wants to encourage us and challenge us here this evening. At the end of 2023, let's keep going around. Let's keep going around. Keep going around and around and around. Why? Not aimlessly, not pointlessly, but let's keep praying over these promises. Let's keep believing these promises. Why? Because the walls are going to come down. The promises are going to come down. God is going to fulfill his word. What we are doing is not in vain this evening, but God is hearing our prayers and it will happen at the right time. It might be the sixth time. It might be the seventh time. It might be the hundredth time. But let's keep going around. Why? Because we know it's going to come. It's going to come. This promise is going to come. The latter days are going to be greater than the former days. And how many of you are thankful even for Sunday? Seeing the church packed, seeing people giving up their seats because there's not enough room in our church. Seeing our kids' room packed out with new families, new kids. That's a promise from God. I don't know how we're going to contain a thousand people when we're struggling to contain a hundred people at this moment in time. But God's going to do it. God's promise is faithful. And what God has promised for this church, he's going to fulfill in your life as well. Household salvation is going to come for you. Backsliders, they will come back. We believe in for this. God is going to fulfill his word. And so tonight, as we go around that wall one more time, as we pray again for our community, as we pray again for our loved ones, as we pray again for the promises, let's not be discouraged because it's going to come. The promise is going to come. Let's keep seeking God and let's trust in God and believe God. Best days are ahead of us. He will fulfill his word.